Uh, Rabbi Julia Andelman here, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our series, The Other in Jewish Texts and Tradition. Um, special welcome to anyone joining us for the first time today, and you can view recordings of past sessions if you'd like using the link in the email that you received from Lynn Feynman this morning. Um, it's funny, I'm coming to this Zoom right, um, right after a she or a class on uh, Jewish divorce law, and it, it kind of throws into real relief um, the, the role of our session today in the series um, about the concept of the other. Um, women in, in the times of the Talmud were, um, were very much other. It's something that's hard about studying Talmud today, um, and we're so blessed to have scholars like Professor Jewish Hauptman who have, Ju excuse me, Judith Hauptman, who have um, really studied in depth the role of women um, in, in Talmudic texts. And I think to some extent um, redeemed some of that for us. So her session today is some unexpected stories about women in the Talmud. And she'll be discussing how um, despite the focus on men, the overwhelming focus on men in the Talmud, um, that there are stories in the Talmud that do feature wives and mothers and daughters of rabbis who play a role in Jewish law. Um, and she'll be walking us through some of those. I think that Professor Hammond needs almost no introduction, but just for the sake of it, um, She's the E. Billy Avery Professor Emerita of Talmud and Rabbinic Culture at JTS, and she recently finished writing a book on halachic anecdotes in the Babylonian Talmud from which the stories in today's session will be drawn. I want to um, thank the, our, the sponsors of today's session. Um, at the Tzaddik level, we have Cantor Sarah Geller, who has sponsored today, today's session in memory of Ethel Geffen. Um, and uh, who was inspired by Professor Hauptman to study Talmud, how perfect for today. Um, and at the Chacham level, uh, Toby Deutsch, who had sponsored the session in memory of her husband, Larry Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. And for anyone else, if you're feeling inspired by this opportunity to engage in Jewish learning with JTS's Outstanding Scholars, we would like to invite you to partner with us in sponsoring a learning session. And uh, you can email um, learninglives at jtsa.edu to learn more, and we will be putting a link in the chat as well. Um, that's all for me. I will turn it over to Tani for some additional instructions. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so just to quickly go over the um, Q&A, um, you can... Um, use the chat feature to submit your questions to um, Rabbi Julia Andelman. Uh, to open the chat, hover your cursor over the bottom of the Zoom screen um, and click on the chat icon. Um, during the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Houtman. Um, please note that you will only be able to chat with JTS staff. You will not be able to send messages to the group or to Dr. Houtman. Um, Professor Hauptman has uh, also requested that we, uh, during the, the Q&A period, during the session, um, that we limit questions that are uh, specifically pertaining to um, the, the Talmudic stories that she'll be sharing. Um, and then we will have some more time at the end of the session for some general questions. Um, for any technical or logistical questions, you can initiate a private chat with either myself or with Lynn Feynman um, for any, any of those kinds of questions that come up during the session. Um, and I am pleased to turn it over now to um, Dr. Houtman. Um, and, and just one other one other thing to note, I, I noticed that there were a couple of questions about the sources. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be sharing a link again to the sources in the chat. I'm sorry for anyone who's had trouble um, downloading the sources and we will be um, screen sharing the sources as well. Uh, you're still muted, Professor Haman. All right, uh, welcome to everybody uh, here today. Um, Shalom Aleichem, I'm delighted to be here as well. And let me, oh, I just wanna make one comment about the questions. During the Q and A breaks, I will try to focus on 
questions specific to the anecdotes, but if you have a general question, don't hold back on submitting it because by the end of the hour and a half, you may totally forget what you want to ask. So Rabbi Julia Enderman will um, choose those questions first, which are specific to the stories. And, um, and then she will ask me anything more general uh, as, time were, as time permits, uh, particularly at the end. All right, the title of this um, session is Some Unexpected Stories About Women in the Talmud. I just wanna say uh, the word unexpected plays into your prejudices. That is to say, um, these are only, unex only unexpected because you thought that women in the Talmud would, would not play the roles that I am hoping today to show you that they did play. So it's kind of um, a loaded word. Now, a few introductory comments and then I will get right to the texts. The, um, the Talmud, as most of us uh, who are familiar with Talmud, we know that it's a repository of halacha and Agadah. Halacha is Jewish law, rules of Jewish practice. And Agadah has many different interpretations, but the one I'll just throw out for the moment is moral teachings. So I'm not going to be dealing with Agadah today. I'm going to be dealing with Halakha. But what I want to say right now at the outset is most people think of Halakha, um, Jewish practice, they think of it as prescriptive, that the Talmud tells you um, how to observe the Sabbath, uh, how to read from the Megillah on Purim, how to get rid of Chametz from Pesach. True the overwhelming majority of material of texts that appear in the halachic portions of the Talmud are prescriptive. I certainly don't deny that. But what people have overlooked for centuries, maybe even going back just close to the end of the time of the Talmud, what they have overlooked is that there is descriptive halacha as well. And what I mean by that, I'm calling it descriptive halacha, alternatively, synonymously, halachic anecdotes. Now, what do I mean by that? that in the discussion in the Talmud, in the sugya, the unit of discourse, the Talmud presents a rule, states clearly some rule, and then uh, rabbis over the generations and over the geographical locations, rabbi discuss, rabbis discuss it back and forth, and then, and then it ends. However, in every so often, by that I mean every three, four pages from the Talmud, at the very end of the give and take analysis of the prescriptive rule, there will be a descriptive anecdote. It will say, Rabbi so-and-so carried out the halacha in this particular way. And these statements are very short and very pithy. What I began to notice uh, as I turned the pages of the Talmud and stumbled upon these anecdotes, I didn't have a hypothesis to begin with, but as over the years, as I stumbled upon these very small stories or anecdotes, not just about women, but about people, rabbis, relatives of rabbis, people. Uh, as, I can, as I stumbled across these anecdotes, I began to notice that, and I'm gonna say it in the most extreme form possible, in every single anecdote, the rabbi who performed, the rabbi or the woman or the slave or the sister or the mother, whoever it was, who, the protagonist, whoever performed the halakha, as the uh, anecdote is presented in the Talmud, the person performing the halakha made a little adjustment in it as he or she performed it, tweaked, tweaked the halakha. And yes, was I surprised to discover this to be the case? Very much so, because if there's anything that we as Jews, Jews in general, think about halakha is that it is fixed. Now, I don't mean we in the conservative movement. I'm just saying we, uh, over the uh, global Jewish world, the sense is that Judaism is, has continuity with the past, that the way we observe Shabbat today is more or less the way our grandparents and great-grandparents and all the way back observed um, the Sabbath, observed halacha. The last thing I expected to find was that in these little anecdotes, the message the Talmud is communicating to the audience that the Talmud reaches, uh, either people read the Talmud or hear the Talmud, the message the Talmud is communicating is that in its own day, that's the point I'm trying to make, that in its own day, uh, the rabbis of the Talmud lived between the years 200 common era and shall we say 550 common era. There's debate about that, but that's for argument's sake. The rabbis in those days, as their performance of halakha is presented to us in the Talmud, the editors of the Talmud, 
or the rabbis themselves, but surely the editors of the Talmud are telling us that when a law is formulated first in a study house, in a Beit Midrash, fine. Uh, people sit around a table, and by that I mean that male rabbis sit around a table and they figure out something and they decide on it and they put it out there. But generations later, and there's often a gap between the rabbi who promulgated the halakha and a couple of hundred years later, we get a little anecdote about how somebody performed that halakha. The Talmud itself is telling us that what they formulate uh, you know, in the uh, rarefied atmosphere of the Beit Midrash is not necessarily the way things work out in real life. And when you are confronting the circumstances of real life, it may become necessary to alter the halacha somewhat. I don't want to belabor that point now. You're going to hear me repeat it a number of times this afternoon, but I'll just make one, uh, I'll state one implication of it. Um, this means that, to my mind, this means that when the conservative movement makes a decision different, that is different from what the rabbis of the past have decided, and we do know that the, I, I now am a member of the CJLS, Committee of Jewish Law and Standards of the Conservative Movement, um, when we come out with a new ruling, a new response, we are fully within our rights, our halachic um, framework, when we alter a rule of the past because the, my point is that the Talmud itself is suggesting to us that it is okay to make changes in Jewish law over time as circumstances change. That's not the main point of today's uh, session, but I just wanted you, to, I wanted you to make sure that I do see that as kind of a line continuing from the past to the present. We now turn to the first anecdote, we're going to screen share. Uh, Tani is going to screen share, and the first anecdote comes from Tractate Ketubot. Um, Ketuba is a marriage document, and I need to give you a little bit of background before we get into the um, text itself. The Mishnah, which is the earlier stratum, the Mishnah states very clearly that a wife owes her husband seven domestic tasks: tochenet, ofam, mechabeset. She's to grind the grain, bake the bread. Um, do the laundry, cook the food, take care of the kids, make the bed, and work in wool. These are the obligations that a wife has to her husband. It's understood in Jewish marriage. That's how Jewish marriage works. However, the Mishnah, the very same Mishnah that I just quoted, goes on to say that if she brings one maidservant into the marriage, she can delegate one, two, and three, the first three tasks to that maidservant. Two maidservants, she can delegate more. Three maidservants, she can get rid of all seven of her domestic obligations, but she'll need to supervise them. And then the Mishnah says, and now I'm beginning the text itself, so I hope I want to see it on screen, or you have it in front of you, so I will continue talking now, and hopefully it's on screen. We're, yeah, we're having, unfortunately, a technical problem with sharing the screen, so I would just ask everyone to use um, to use the, the attachment that was posted in the chat or in um, the link that was in Lynn's email to you. Okay. Um, I'm beginning text number one, um, Arba Yoshevet Bakatedra, which means that when um, she brings four maid servants into the marriage, she can sit in a katedra, it's like the word cathedral, comes from the Greek, and it means a throne-like chair, okay? So a woman with four servants need not even supervise her servants, need not fulfill for her husband any one of those seven tasks because she's got it covered and she's got somebody supervising the three maidservants who are going to do the work. All right, that's the quote from the Mishnah that begins. These are very short stories. Um, there's a little bit of discussion of halacha and then we get to the story. All right, I'm continuing to read. So this rabbi says, even though the Mishnah says that with four maidservants, she can sit in a throne, you know, a lady of leisure, a ladies of lunch, or whatever it's called. Still, he says, here are three tasks, seven she got rid of, but here are three tasks which she may not delegate. And they are, she must prepare his wine. That is to say, mozeket means to mix because wine used to come out concentrated and you had to dilute it two parts, three parts with water. So she would prepare his drink for him. 
Matzat lo atamita, should need to make his bed. Now, let me just clarify that making his bed was on the list of seven. It's now repeated, apparently, there are commentaries on this, apparently, because the uh, obligatory making of the bed means, you know, beating out the quilts and um, changing the sheets and so on. This matzat lo hamita, and I'll support it a little bit more in a moment, this matzat lo hamita apparently means turning down the blankets, plumping up the pillow, they're going to bed, all right? So she's bringing him his nightcap, mozegat locos. She's plumping up the pillows. And now, this, some of you may find this offensive, umar chetzet lo panav yadav And before they get into bed at night, this rabbi says it is her obligation to wash for him his face, his hands, and his feet. Well, surely if he's been working all day in the fields, it makes sense to get into bed clean. But according to the Rashi, Rashi's commentator, commentary on the Talmud, she does, she engages in these activities um, for Chiba, to make him feel affection for her. Okay, so at the moment, we've got a woman who has seven domestic responsibilities, which can be offloaded, but then she's got three personal responsibilities, which cannot be offloaded. As the commentators point out, you, you don't ask your maidservant to do this. This is what you are going to do for your husband. Uh, are we picturing a patriarchal society in which she serves him and he does not serve her? Of course, uh, I don't need to um, say that uh, ever again. It's, it's clear. Okay, but now we get to the next paragraph. Amar Yitzhak Bar Hananya Amar Rav Huna. This is the same pair of rabbis. Rav Huna is a giant in the Babylonian Talmud, and is, it is his student, Rav Yitzchak Brachananya, who's transmitting to us the first teaching, which I just mentioned, those three responsibilities that she has to him not to delegate. And now he says the following, Kol malachot shahayisha osala ba'ala, nida osala ba'ala. All those tasks which a woman is expected to perform for a husband, we've been through them, the seven, let's say she doesn't have maid servants, and then the three more, the personal ones. Even when she is nida, even when she is a menstruant, even in the days of blood flow, um, she still is obligated to perform the seven for her husband, either delegate or perform herself. But then he goes on to say, so Rav Huna is saying in this second statement, well, she has personal obligations to her husband, preparing his nighttime drink, uh, you know, pumping up the pillows and so on, and washing face, hands, and feet, but not when she is nida, not when she is a menstruant. And although he doesn't explain, uh, it's pretty obvious, and again, the commentators say it more explicitly, that these kinds of activities are erotic in nature, and if she engages in these activities when sex is not permitted to take place between a husband and a wife, um, she will be um, tantalizing him. She will be uh, erotically um, you know, arousing him, and it's not going to end well. So, so this rabbi, just to summarize right now, and we're getting to the anecdotes in a moment, so far, all we've done is prescriptive halacha. Next will come the descriptive. So just to summarize, a woman uh, has obligations to her husband at night, uh, so to speak, in the bedroom. I'm not sure how much privacy they had back then, but be that as it may, bring him his nightcap, plump up the pillows, you know, turn down the blankets, and wash face, hands, and feet. Yes, and, and they are erotic activities, so they may not be performed. These additional three may not be performed when she's a nida. Okay, this is not hard to understand. Now the Gemara comments on what Rav Huna said. Umizigat hakos, I'm down to the bottom of the uh, first story, pouring him his nighttime drink. Now, there are four anecdotes, very, very short coming up. I'm going to just translate them and then I'll go back and comment. Shmuel is an early rabbi, first generation Babylonian rabbi. Machlafale debitu biyada desmola. Okay, I have to comment on the words here. Debitu means his wife. I'll get back to that in a second. She switched it to her left hand. Now, 
what is going on here? So first of all, the word debitu, if you're looking at it, you see the word buy it right in there. This is Aramaic, but it's also a Semitic language related to Hebrew. So debitu, which I translate as wife, which is standard, it literally means of his house. So housewife. Okay, I don't think it's uh, denigrating her. It's simply describing her. So she switches it, the nighttime drink. You see, the words here are umizigat hakos. The Gemara now is commenting on that one small piece of what Rav Huna, through his servant, was teaching us. So um, for Shmuel, his wife would um, switch it to her left hand, meaning when she brought, oh, meaning, this woman has decided to service her husband when she is a nida. Now, Rav Huna said, no, you do not bring your husband a drink when you are a nida because you know one thing is going to lead to another. But Shmuel's wife decided, um, and it's pretty clear to me that she knew that teaching because otherwise the story wouldn't make sense. So she switched it to her left hand. Okay, this is a very, very critically important uh, detail. The serving hand is the right hand. The left hand, as we learn from Talmud Brachot and from Greco-Roman sources, that's the toileting hand, okay? So the, the proper way, serving your husband his night drink um, means to give it to him with your right hand. If you are extending the cup of wine to your husband with your left hand, this is the point now, technically you are not serving it to him. You can only call it serving when it's with the right hand. You cannot call it serving with the left hand. So let's just ponder for a moment the ingenuity of this woman and the other three women are going to do exactly the same. What she apparently said to herself was, well, I'm Nida, I'm menstruant. I'm not allowed to have sex with my husband. And these rabbis are telling me I shouldn't even bring him his nighttime drink, let alone pump up the pillows and so on. But we'll just concentrate on the drink. And she probably says to herself, He's used to getting that drink at night. And maybe, maybe she even says to herself, one of the women in the Women's League, when I was teaching this at JTS a number of years ago, suggested this to me. Maybe she even says to herself, I don't think I want the maid servant coming in tonight into his bedroom and bringing him his wine and who knows, um, washing his face, hands and feet for him. I'm going to be there, she's saying to herself, but I know I can't serve it to him, which means I can give it to him with my right hand. So, hey, I'll give it to him with my left hand and that way he'll get his drink. Beverage service will continue. No breaks, no seven day break in beverage service. She, I, I, I'm getting excited about this because this is one of my all time favorite um, sugyot, the units in the Talmud. She took the law into her own hands, very literally speaking now, and realized that she had to follow that rule of no physical contact, no erotic behavior at night in the bedroom. But she said to herself, he's used to his drink. He wants his drink. I can't get into bed with him tonight, but I can give him his drink as long as I don't serve it to him. So she figured out how to do it. And then the other three wives do exactly, almost exactly the same, but even they improve. Abaye, manchale, apuma, dekuba. I see, and the um, number of words in the anecdote are shrinking because once you get the idea, you don't have to have all the words there. So Abaye's wife, that's understood, put it for him, the drink for him on the mouth of the cask. This is a great solution. She wants him to have his drink, as I've already mentioned, and she knows she can't serve it to him. So she says, well, if I take it, okay, yeah, I have a bottle of water here. If I take it and I just put it down close to where he is, he'll get it and I will not have served it to him because serving means putting it in his hand and I'm not gonna put it in his hand. And then Rabbah, Rabbah's wife, these are well-known rabbis in the Babylonian Talmud, Abbe Sadia, his wife put it on the pillow, the drink. And Rav Papa, that's going further down the generations, Ashar Shifa, Sraf Rav, she put it on the little stool near the bed. So here we have four women spanning um, some of the generations, not all of the generations, each of whom figured out a way to circumvent the limitation that Rav Huna was placing on these women when they were in Nida. They're not, they're not having sex with their husband at a time when they're not supposed to, 
but they are, you know, the mission was all about women serve husbands, women, you know, cook for them and take care of the kids for them and grind the uh, grain and bake the bread. So we understand that women are in that, uh, mandated by men to be in that role. And this woman is saying, okay, maybe I have maid servants doing all of those seven tasks and I'm limited, you know, I don't have to perform those. So I'll just engage in these three personal tasks that the rabbis have suggested. Ah, now we've got the screen share, okay? So these women are saying, okay, um, I'll abide by Rav Huna. I don't want to um, really touch him. I don't want to behave particularly in an erotic manner, but I'm going to get him as my time drink. So these women tweaked, made an adjustment, modified the rule of Rav Huna. Now, interesting to say, for the sake of their husbands, okay? Maybe you want to say for the sake of their marriage. Okay, you, you can say that too. But I am claiming that this is one of the few places in the Talmud where women take the law into their own hands and introduce a change in it. And I'm sure the rabbis of the Talmud were happy to record these anecdotes because the change was of direct benefit to them. After all, she wasn't drinking the wine herself. She was giving it to him. All right, sometimes people say to me, well, don't get so excited about women changing Jewish law. Um, maybe it was their husbands who told them to do it. Well. I can't tell you that I know for sure that it was uh, the women's own um, intuition, uh, ability to think things through and so on, taking the law into their own hands. I can't swear to that. But I read enough Talmud to tell you that if the Talmud is presenting it to us as this is what she did, then I think the Talmud is telling us she, meaning all of these four women, she solved the problem. It was not he who told her what to do. and. The thing that I believe I did not mention earlier was these uh, little anecdotes, which I put in bold, they're right there. Um, these little anecdotes end the discussion. What continues right after this in the Babylonian Talmud is a different statement of Rahuna on something totally unrelated to what we've been discussing. So this is another very important point about these little anecdotes. Um, I don't know if I'll say this again, so I'm just gonna say it now uh, for one time. And that is, the anecdote in 99 cases out of 100 ends the discussion, which means no commentary on it, uh, not by later rabbis, not by anonymous rabbis, and, you know, by nobody actually. It ends the discussion, which means the anecdote, we rule according to the anecdote. It is generally true in the Talmud that the latest generation commenting on the halakha, we decide according to that. And yes, I have looked this up in the Shulchan Aruch, and this is exactly what the Shulchan Aruch says. The Shulchan Aruch, unlike me, or I, unlike the Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch does not acknowledge that at first Rav Huna said such and such and outlawed women doing the, serving the husband the nighttime drink, and then along came the women and figured out a way to still get him his drink. I'm claiming that we see here uh, evolution in Jewish law, but the Shulchan Aruch simply says, this is how you do it when a woman is nita, period. Okay, um, the first break is gonna take place after the second anecdote, which uh, is not as long as the first. Okay, I'm moving now to number two. This comes from a different uh, tractate of the Talmud altogether, Beitzah. Beitzah means egg, because the first Mishnah of tractate Beitzah talks about an egg laid on a holiday, since the egg wasn't in existence at the time the holiday began, are you allowed to eat it on the holiday or must all foodstuffs be ready to be eaten at the onset of the holiday? People make fun of um, that rule. I don't. I think there are some very important principles in it, but that's not our subject today. The important thing for you to know right now is that unlike Shabbat, when cooking is not allowed, making a fire is not allowed on Shabbat, on Yom Tov, Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuot, so on, um, obviously not Yom Kippur, on Jewish holidays, cooking is allowed, baking bread is allowed. Um, that's all I need to tell you right now. And now we're getting right into the anecdote. So the Mishnah, um, I begin with the Mishnah. Um, the first statement of the Mishnah is you don't um, intentionally break up clay pots on 
on a holiday, it may be a reason you want to break up a clay. Uh, pure, you may be using it for various um, kitchen tasks, but okay, I'm not addressing that, but I am addressing the following. And then the Mishnah says, no raking out, engorfin, engorfin is to rake out, no raking out an oven or a stove, kirayim is a stove, uh, on Yom Tov, abam mechamshin. To rake out means, now if you can imagine an igloo, um, they had um, stoves that, you know, not inside the kitchen, but out in the courtyard or um, a number of families shared it. It was a small structure shaped, you know, round, dome-like, like an igloo with an opening. And you would put in, you had a um, flat board, I think it's called a peel, P-E-L, on which you put your dough and you inserted the peel into the oven and then you slapped up, um, you threw the dough um, to attach itself to the wall of the oven. It, think pita, okay? And then when the bread is baked, you come in with the peel and you peel it, you detach the um, bread that's baked and stuck to the side of the uh, wall ceiling of this little igloo oven and you remove it. So that's what you needed to know. And to rake out means stuff accumulates on the floor of the oven, which may be just the earth. Um, ashes accumulate, uh, drippings accumulate, and so on. And what I deduce from the Talmud, which I believe is true to even to this very day, is that you're not going to be able to successfully bake your loaf of bread if you've got uh, a huge pile of ashes, drippings, and so on. Uh, at the bottom, you need to clean out that oven. I don't know how often, but you need to clean out the ashes. So mechab shin means on the holiday itself, no raking out the gunk from the bottom of the oven. Um, we're not talking about stoves anymore, but what you may do on Yom Tov is press down the ashes because that will improve the bread that you are baking. And why do we not uh, rake out ovens on Yom Tov? Because you can do it in advance. It's not something that has to be done every day. So minimize the um, activities that you are engaging in on Yom Tov, which in a sense could be construed as, you know, by compromising the sanctity of the day. There's no need. Do your grifa, your raking out before Yom Tov. Okay, that's the Mishnah. And now I go to the Gemara. The Gemara says, Engorfin Tanur Bechirayim. That's just a quote from the Mishnah. I am skipping the next two lines because I'll return to them because I want to read uh, the pieces of this sugya in chronological order. So I'm going to the last piece, which is in bold letters. Devitu de Rabbi Chia. Now you already know that Devitu is his wife. So Rabbi Chia's wife, Nafala Aricha Betanura Biyomatava. What happened uh, to Rabbi Chia's wife is that an aricha, a brick, fell down, nafala, into the oven on a Yom Tov. Oh my goodness, you've got a brick in the oven. It sounds like a hole in the bucket, but you've got a brick in the oven on Yom Tov. Your bread is going to burn. It's not a good situation. And yes, we, we do know that unless you had a bakery nearby, you were baking bread every day in the ancient world, which is another good reason why you would have um, maidservants take care of some of these backbreaking activities for you. So we've got a woman confronting a difficult situation. What is, she's gonna, what is she going to do? If she puts the dough into the oven with a brick on the floor of the oven, the bread is not gonna bake well. If she doesn't break, bake the bread on the holiday, her husband is, virtually certain to be angry with her. Uh, you know, bread is staff of life, basis of the meal and so on. So what is she going to do? And what she apparently does is consult her husband, who is Rabbi Chia. And it's important for you to note that Rabbi Chia is a transitional generation. He's at the very end of the uh, period of the Mishnah and at, therefore at the very beginning of the period of the Gemara. You can call him an Amora, a Gemara rabbi, or you can call him a Tana. Most of us, generally speaking, we call him an Amora, very early Amora. So she apparently comes to her husband because what we have here is his response. Amar la Rabbi Chia, so he says to his wife, Chazi, look, lady, look, honey, da'ana rifta malyata ba'ina. Look, I rifta bread malyata, excellent ba'ina, I want. Which means, honey, you go and bake me really tasty bread. So what is he saying to her? He's saying to her, 
go and rake out that oven. All right, now the question is, is Rabbi Chia um, opposing, you know, conflicting with a rule in the Mishnah, which says no raking out the oven on a holiday? Well, um, yes and no. He's not saying to her, it's okay in general to rake out an oven on the holiday. What he's saying to her is, in this unanticipated, unforeseen circumstance of a brick in the oven that's going to ruin the bread, ah, in this kind of circumstance, we'll call it bidiyavad, uh, you know, after the fact. That is to say, Yom Tov began, and you thought everything was fine, and you had probably had raked out your oven before Yom Tov, but oh my God, you come there in the morning ready to put in your dough, and you see a brick in the oven. So you run and you say to husband, what am I going to do? And he says, you get me tasty bread, which means he is tweaking the law. Okay, she is not tweaking the law. She is the trigger here. She comes to him and says, what am I going to do? Which, by the way, clearly means she knows she is not allowed to rake out the oven on Yom Tov. Now, some people say to me, so big deal if she knew she's not allowed to rake out the oven. Don't women learn all these things from their mothers? Well, yes. I do think women learn a lot about Jewish practice from their mothers, their aunts, and so on, other relatives, other women. But um, the rabbis are coming out with new rules day after day, week after week, month after month. So my one of my arguments, this is a logical argument, of course, I have to bring evidence, but one of my logical arguments is if you're a rabbi and you come out with a new rule such as um, no raking out the oven on the holiday, if you don't teach it to your wife, she is going to rake out the oven on the holiday, and you're going to be eating bread that she baked in violation of Jewish law, because she baked it in an oven that she just raked out. So yes, I really do think that when rabbis came home from their study hall sessions and had just passed on new rules, I think, and I have an article on this, I think they taught them to their wives. So she apparently knows this rule. I can't tell if it's from her mother or from her husband, whatever. She knows this rule. And she says to him, what am I going to do? The, um, there's a brick in the oven. And he, instead of saying to her, um, you know, I'm going to change the Mishnah. I'm going to drop the word Ain. I'm just going to say Gorfin Tanur. He's not telling her it's okay to rake out an oven in general on Yom Tov. He's just tweaking it and saying, in the case of an unforeseen circumstance, it's okay. Now, I'm going back to the middle section. Tani Rav Chia Bar Yosef Kame de Rav Nachman. This is happening later than the anecdote we just read. And this, uh, this is a rule put forth um, in the presence of Rav Nachman, who is a leading Babylonian rabbi. Vim elam ken gorfo mutar. Apparently, based on the anecdote, the modification of the Mishnah is as follows. If it's impossible to bake unless you first rake out the oven, of course, we're talking about on a holiday, mutar, it is permitted. In other words, the Mishnah is the Mishnah. Uh, no raking out ovens on the holiday. But here's the exception to the rule. If something happened, um, that prevents you from baking your bread on the holiday, you know, unanticipated, you did everything you were supposed to do on Friday, I mean, the day before the holiday, rather, and then something happened, then you can go ahead and rake it out on the holiday. So I can't be sure, but it seems to me that the anecdote led to that um, exception, that tweaking of Jewish law. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the Talmud Yerushalmi, the parallel Talmud from the land of Israel, um, has the story, but with certain changes. And I see that I, um, it's almost, I'm going to go through this text fast, this Yerushalmi, and then we're going to break for Q&A. Bir Rabbi Chia Rabba, Atat Nefa Go Tanura. The daughter of Rabbi Chia Rabba, Rabbi Chia Rabba means the great Rabbi Chia, she came to bake in, a, in an oven, uh, obviously on a holiday, because that's the context, Ashkecha Kippah Begabe, and she found a rock, the, here the word Kippah means a rock, um, inside the oven. Atat Shalat La'avuha, she came and, and asked her father, meaning, what do I do, dad? 
Amarla Aislin Garfin. So he said to her, go and rake it out. Now, that sounds like he's um, ruling against the Mishnah, or in any event, he's at least making an exception to the rule of Mishnah. Amra, so what does she say to him when he says to her, go rake it out? Lena yachla, ani lo yachola. I can't, meaning Jewish law doesn't allow me. She knows to rake out the oven on the holiday. So he then says to her, Amarla, Aislin Kavshin, fine, if you're not going to rake it out, at least go and press down the ashes. She knew this rule that um, you can press down the ashes, but she wanted to hear it from her father. So I'll just say one more thing, and then I'm going to leave you with a question. In what way are these two stories similar and different from each other? Meaning you have the same story here. The Yerushalmi version is probably earlier. And when it got transmitted to Babylonia, it changed somewhat. I want you to identify the changes. And um, I think with that, I will stop right here. Okay, wonderful. We have um, so many questions. So um, I'll, I'll just be able to get to a few. So a couple of people have noted, um, Helene um, notes, and as well as our friends, um, Clifford and Debbie Miller, that the you know, these stories about women tweaking the halacha, they're, they're written and recorded by men. So that's sort yes. of an interesting point. And what do we want to say about that? And then, um, and the Millers put even a finer point on it, um, you know, sort of asking specifically with regard to the first sogya, why why are they sharing this are they proud of their wives ingenuity are they do want do they want to give others some idea of um loopholes when it comes to nida or in this case um the bread what what's uh, in general and specifically why do they want to put these stories into the talmud okay well i think uh, the millers have given me an opportunity to push my uh, general thesis which is i think that Every couple of pages in the Talmud, when we find a little story of this sort, I think the Talmud is interesting in telling us uh, in its own way, not exactly openly, the Talmud never says, well, you can even challenge me on that, but in general, aside from Masechet Idriot and here and there, but the Talmud doesn't openly say, halacha is open to change as situations change. But I think they were interested um, you wrote here, you told me sharing and ingenuity and recorded by men. I think the men who put together the Talmud, it's pretty clear to me that it was men who put it together, not women. Um, I think the men who put it together are hinting to you, or it's more than a hint, are teaching you that things don't have to remain the same. Well, the, the uh, bread story, um, that was an unforeseen circumstance. So in a way, I don't even know, I'll, I'll call it a change because the mission never said, well, if, if need arises, then you can go ahead and um, rake out that oven. So these rabbis are saying, here are some more options. Let me explain to you. Yes, there's a rule, no wrecking out the oven. Of course you should do it in advance, et cetera, et cetera. And with the nida, it's totally self-serving why they put those anecdotes in. They're basically saying, well, our wives love to serve us. Um, I've, I've actually read up on this somewhat. In the Shulchan Aruch, they actually say it is a woman's job to serve her husband. And then they start listing many, many different ways, more than, than you have in that particular text. So yes, so it, it is definitely self-interest on the part of men for the first anecdote to list those creative solutions so that um, he has uninterrupted nightcap service uh, throughout the month. He doesn't lose it one week out of a month. You know, I'm generalizing one week out of a month when his wife is a nido. Yes. Um, and, but the more general message, I see I wrote down the word loopholes as well. Uh, if you see this, if you see, okay, this book I just wrote, I analyze give or take 80 sugyo. We're going to look at four today. Um, I, and, and the 80 sugyo are not about women. The four or five of them are about women, but most of them aren't, or at least they're not about women changing law. So, what I'm claiming is that when you study Talmud vertically, you know, you go down the page, linear, line after line after line after line, 
oh, and then you come across an anarch and you say, oh, isn't that nice? And then you go more and more and more and more and more halacha. By the time you come to another anecdote and a third and a fourth and a fifth, you don't connect them because they're far apart, they're scattered. And you don't say, oh my God, there's a principle here. And this principle is halacha is open to change depending on circumstantial uh, changes. So yes, um, that's what I think is going on here. I think I've answered the question. Okay. Can okay, we have time for another one? Sure. Um, so uh, Rabbi J.B. Sachs um, was asking if, if part of this is about um, we're not just dealing with any women here, but with the wives of rabbis. So is that part of why there's some deference to them? Were they more educated? What do we know about them and how does that relate to their, their ability to, to uh, make these tweaks happen? Okay, so first of all, thank you, Rabbi J.B. Sachs. Uh, it's unfortunate that just about every anecdote that involves a woman in the Talmud, she is, these women are, close relatives of rabbis, sisters, daughters, mothers, um, what I leave out here, one more, mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, wives, yes, obviously. Um, the stories in the Talmud are about women that the rabbis know well. So um, can I extrapolate to all women? Well, not really, these women, because of the environment in which they are living are more educated than other women. Chances are they knew more halakha because uh, you know, back then they didn't have a JTS on 122nd and Broadway. The study halls were the rabbi's living room, the rabbi's courtyard, uh, walking to the bathhouse with a rabbi, taking a, a hike with a rabbi. That's how you study, well, to study Talmud is a little bit anachronistic, but that's how halakha developed back then. So um, coming back to um, putting all this together in terms of women, uh, I can extrapolate from other anecdotes in the Talmud that we're talking in general about Jewish law, but when it comes to these women, I can only say this is what the Talmud is telling us about the close female relatives of rabbis. But um, you can learn from here that halacha changes, but I would never want to learn that halacha changes over time just from these stories that happen to evolve women. That wouldn't be um, a broad enough sample. I need a much, much larger sample. Okay. Do you want to take one more? Okay, if it's a uh, up to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Hadassah Weiner was, uh, I'll just read what she wrote. A rabbi friend of mine once quoted her mother thus, if the rabbis of the Talmud had ever spent any time in the kitchen, we wouldn't need to have two of everything. Um, is there evidence in the Talmud of rabbis actually spending time in the kitchen or of women tweaking the laws of kashrut? I, I would not, I would brought in the question, um, right, is there, is there sort of an acknowledgement that there, um, there are certain realms in which women have the knowledge? Yes, yes, there's just no question. Um, these laws that we're looking at today, the last one does not deal with kitchen matters, but the next one is gonna deal with, in other words, the first one dealt with nida, which is a woman's area. The numbers two and three deal with food and kitchen. And the last one is gonna deal with something entirely different. We'll get to it. So um, it is rather clear to me, and I've written about this in a different article, that men, rabbis, did not step foot in the kitchen. And that's why I say, that if they're gonna tell you how to search for chametz or how to kosher your pots or whether you need to break your clay pots uh, and not to eat um, out of chametz dishes on Pesach, they need, if they're gonna pass those rules in the study hall, they are gonna wind up eating, I'll go to the extreme case, they're gonna wind up eating chametz on Pesach, 11 products on the holiday of Pesach when it's forbidden, unless they teach the new rules that they've just come up with in the study hall, unless they teach those new rules to their wives. So yes, um, I will also say that uh, of these 80 anecdotes or so that I talk about in my book, uh, no, 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 this, I can't say that, um, because those anecdotes are generally speaking not about women. Okay, but I, I will just say that the stories about women more often than not, 
and not just today, obviously, but uh, many other cases, more often than not um, place women or have women discussing food issues, kitchen issues, and so on. Yes, that's, that was the stereotypical role of women back then, women in the kitchen, and then didn't step foot, except for one thing I have to say, which I hear, I don't live in the suburbs, so I don't have a grill, but I, according to the Talmud, when it came to um, grilling meat, you know, firing up the oven, uh, whatever, not the oven, the grill, it was men who um, grilled the meat back then, and people tell me that in suburbia, it is men who do the barbecue. Uh, but aside from that, they did not step foot into the kitchen and barbecue was outside. So they did not step foot into the kitchen. And then you're gonna ask me what were kitchens like in those days? I've tried to look into this. And it seems that kitchens were open air. In other words, I'm talking about that igloo oven that was definitely not inside the house, that was outside the house. And um, that's, uh, that's how it worked. Okay, I will continue now with anecdote number three. I think I'm gonna do three and four. Well, three, and we'll take a short break, and then four. Okay, three, hulling barley on the Sabbath. This is, again, from the tractate called Beitzah, so I don't have to say anything about it. And this is what you need to know. Um, I didn't know the words hulling barley till I started learning this sugya, and then I looked up the English translation. When I go to the soup market and I buy a bag of barley, it'll say on the bag of barley, pearled barley. So I thought, oh, it looks like little pearls. Well. I, I don't think that's the origin of it. To hull barley means to remove the outer husk and then to pearl barley. Pearl barley is barley, which is already hulled, meaning it's had not just its husk, but it's bran, bran removed, okay? I hope that's clear. So what we're talking about here in this sugya is not pearled barley, but hulling barley, which is removing the out, outside of the um, kernel uh, of barley. And um, yes, so the other thing I need to tell you is that, well, let's just get into the sugya and I will <laughs> give you information as the need arises. Okay, tsunan hatam, hamakalef seorim, if you are hulling seorim of barley, if you're hulling grains of barley, meaning peeling, removing the outer layer, mekalef achad achad ba'ochel, you may um, one at a time hull the grains of barley and pop them into your mouth. By the way, I didn't address the words tnan hatam. I will go back to those in a minute. Ve'im kilef and hatam chayav. But if you uh, hold your grains of barley and then you um, put them, you know, you cupped your hand and you filled your hand with hulled barley, you are liable. So the question is liable for what? This Mishnah, as I say in the English, comes from Ma'asrot. Ma'aser means a tithe. So these are the, the rules of tithing are as follows. If you're just going to hull enough barley to pop it into your mouth, to eat it like a snack, to eat it, you know, like uh, popcorn or like potato chips, you know, one at a time, it's not a meal, it's just a snack. Well, that grain that you brought in from your own field and that you snack on, you're not liable to give um, tithe to the Levite from snacked barley. But if you um, hold enough to have a whole handful of barley, you are liable from that larger amount of hulled barley to give one tenth of it to the Levite. Chayav means liable. What did I translate here? He is liable to tithe, meaning you're obligated to tithe. Okay, so far this has nothing to do with women, but let me just point out that the tractate is Beitza, which is about preparing food on a Jewish holiday. And the opening statement has to do with tithing grain that you bring in from the field. That has nothing to do with the Jewish holiday, but we will see in just a moment what the connection is. Amar Rabbi Elazar, v'chein l'shabbat. Rabbi Elazar is a rabbi in the Gemara, so he's not a Tana, not in the period of the Mishnah, he's in the period of the Gemara, and he says, and the same holds for the Sabbath, meaning the notion that if you, on the Sabbath, hull just a few grains of barley, and you know, so to speak, and pop them into your mouth, then you have not violated the Sabbath by threshing on the Sabbath, 
Threshing is one of the 39 forbidden labors, according to Mishma Shabbat, uh, forbidden labors to engage in on the Sabbath. But um, Rabbi Lazar is obviously also saying, you know, just a snack amount, fine, you haven't violated the Sabbath by hulling a few kernels of barley. But if you hull enough barley on the Sabbath to fill a hand, you know, a significant amount, then you have violated the Sabbath. All right. So he's taking that distinction that was made between a snack and a meal over there in Masrot, Mishnah Masrot, and applying it to the Sabbath. All right. Now it gets a little complicated. Ini, is that so? Okay. This is the anonymous voice of the Talmud's editors saying, is that so? Meaning what Rabbi El Azar just said that you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath, meaning whole a handful, is that really so? Baharav, Makalfale debitu kase kase. All right, you see the word debitu again, his wife. So Rav's wife peeled for him, hold for him, peeled for him on the Sabbath, kase kase, couples and couples. For Rabbi Chia, Makalfale debitu kase kase. Rav and Rabbi Chia are related. Rabbi Chia is the uncle of Rav. Rabbi Chia is the land of Israel. Rav is in Babylonia. So here are two anecdotes, very, very brief, just a a report of in these two homes, the wife of this rabbi, Rav or Rabbi Chia, on the Sabbath, hold for him significant amount of uh, barley. And um, really, did they violate the Sabbath? It, it, how, how can what Rabbi Lazar be true? How could Rav and Rabbi Chia have allowed their wives on the Sabbath to hold for them significant amounts of barley? That's a violation of the Sabbath. Serious problem, by the way, okay? It looks as if rabbis are tolerating, okay, in the kitchen, but still, they apparently know about it. They get to eat. You don't cook the barley on the Sabbath. You're just snacking on it, okay? So these rabbis, their wives prepared them a snack on the Sabbath, fed it to them, and my God, according to Rabbi Lazar, this is a violation of the Sabbath. I'm not commenting on generations at the moment, all right? So that's the question. Rabbi Elazar says you can't hold cupfuls or handfuls, same thing, on the Sabbath of barley, and these two women did it. The anonymous editor answers, Ela i itmar, asefa itmar. Okay, this is probably the most complicated Talmudic move that we have today uh, in this particular session, which means Rabbi Elazar's comment was not to be understood. Um, in relative, in relation to barley, which is the first clause of the Mishnah, when he issued that statement, two words, v'chein Shabbat, same rule applies to Shabbat. When he issued that statement, he was really talking about the second clause of the Mishnah about wheat, about removing the bran, the husk, and so on from wheat. And then they just quote the second part of the Mishnah, hamolel mililot shalchitim, when you uh, winnow, um, what do I have here? When you winnow um, ears of wheat, um, I'm going to read my own translation. If one rubs ears of wheat, he may winnow a little at a time and eat without tithing. But if he winnows into his lap, he is liable to tithe. So this is a very interesting move that the editor just made. Just imagine now, the Mishnah has clause one and clause two. At first, we thought the Rabbi Elazar's statement, the same applies to the Sabbath, was made by Rabbi Lazar in relation to clause one. But, and that caused a problem for us because it made the women out to be um, breakers, violators of the Sabbath, transgressing the rules of the Sabbath. So now the anonymous editor says, calm down. When Rabbi Lazar issued his statement, it's just two words. It was we who made a mistake in uh, attaching his two words to clause one of the Mishnah about barley. What he really meant was, on clause two of the mission about wheat, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you do that on the Sabbath, a uh, whole, a couple, a handful, then it's not allowed. Okay, this is, oh, oh Amar Rabbi Lazar, the Chayn Shabbat. Okay, so then Rabbi Lazar said in reference to clause two of the Mishnah, that holds for the Sabbath. So what's going on in this anecdote? This is different from the first two. Here we have women who were doing what they were doing on the Sabbath, hulling cupfuls of barley um, as a snack, by the way. You can just do one at a time and pop it in your mouth. 
but they were preparing it for their husband. So they didn't just throw one kernel to him at a time. They prepared cupfuls and then they brought it to their husband. So it looked as if they were violating the Jewish law because Rabbi Lazar applied that rule about tithing to the Sabbath. Along comes the anonymous editor. He asked the question by citing these women and then he gives the answer, which is, no, leave the women alone. That's basically what's being said here. Leave the women alone. Um, in their day, now here I'll get chronological on you. They lived before, a generation before Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar lives in the land of Israel. He's a third generation rabbi, student of Rabbi Yochanan, a second generation prominent rabbi. So these women, Rav is a first generation Babylonian Mora and Rabbi Chia, we already discussed, same Rabbi Chia, he's this transitional figure. So these women, um, what's happening in this unit is the women are in the clear. They were doing on the Sabbath what was allowed because nobody in their day had yet come along and outlawed what they were doing, all right? But then after Rabbi Al-Azhar issues his statement and gee, and the same idea between a snack and a meal, et cetera, uh, applies to the Sabbath, that cast aspersions on the behavior of the women. So along comes the anonymous editor, the one who raised the question, by citing the anecdotes, and then he himself, of course, I, I don't know if I'm saying he himself or one anonymous editor, another anonymous editor, we don't know, but a, an anonymous editor says, not a problem, leave the women alone. We're gonna uphold what the women are doing. They can go right ahead on the Sabbath and hold couples of barley for their husbands. Again, going back to that question that the Millers asked, yes, <laughs> there is a level of self-interest here on the part of men. Why are these anecdotes recorded here? because um, it's, it, it looked for the moment as if when a later rabbi attempted to impose a stringency to apply the tithing distinctions to Sabbath rules, and by doing that, he was going to put the women in hot water, then the, I think when the question was asked, they kind of already anticipated the answer. And then the answer is no, um, Rabbi Lazar said, um, the tithing rules apply to the Sabbath, but they apply to wheat, leave the barley out of this, what the women are doing, they can continue to do. So in this case, I'm certainly not saying that women are changing Jewish law. What I am saying is that rabbis were upholding women's uh, well-engrained, pun intended, uh, practices. And I will leave it at that. And why don't we take five minutes for questions and then I want to do my fourth sugya, and then whatever time is left, we'll do Q&A. Uh, Julia, are there any questions? Uh, there are there many questions. Oh. OK. Um, all right, I, I love this question, uh, comment slash question from Alan Halpern. I'm going to read it verbatim. Uh, he writes, I'm imagining the rabbis coming home to their wives and explaining their brilliance in the day's discussion, and the wife saying, you are truly a great rabbi, so explain to me about this parentheses, which you obviously didn't think about because you're a man and you're not thinking about the details. How do you imagine the process by, with, by which these anecdotes evolved and were transcribed? Well, um, I will say this much in answer to that question. The anecdotes are not verbatim what took place. There's, there's no reason to think that they are verbatim what took place when the rabbi came home and found his wife doing whatever. Um, the um, Editors of the Talmud, generally speaking, they are anonymous. These uh, editors uh, um, wrote, wrote up, you know, crafted, uh, edited the, the anecdotes in order to make the point that they wanted to make. So what went on between husband and wife? Uh, <laughs> there are, it could be anything. It could be what uh, Rabbi Julia just read, or it could be something entirely different. I don't know in a patriarchal society um, exactly how conversations would take place between husbands and wives. I will say this much though, since you ask, there are quite a few places in the Talmud where the Talmud itself reports that the wife, so to speak, got fresh with her husband. In other words, challenged him or just didn't you know, uh, immediately accept what he was telling her to do. So the women are not just um, pushovers in the various anecdotes the Talmud reports. In these, um, okay, only perhaps in the Yerushalmi did we see 
a woman, I'm answering my own question now, she pushed back. Her father said to her, yes, sweetheart, go and rake out the oven. And she basically says, dad, the Mishnah says I can't do that. And even when he tells her to press it down, it's like she knew it, but she needed to hear it. So this woman, I think is being portrayed, the, the one I'm talking about with breaking out the oven, as against um, change and evolution of Jewish law, but it's not she who, um, you know, so to speak, gets the last word. It's Rabbi Chia, um, who in the, I, I'm gonna say it now in case it doesn't come out of a, a Q and A. Uh, let me just point out that the Babylonian version of that anecdote arrives at a much more lenient resolution than the Yerushalmi. In the Yerushalmi, all she gets to do with her father's imprimatur is to um, press down the ashes. In the Babylonian Talmud, she is basically told, kind of indirectly, but clearly, um, I want good bread, you know, coded for C-O-D-E, for saying, you go and rake out that oven. So the Babylonian Talmud, at least over there, I can't make a generalization. I do happen to think that the Jerusalem Talmud in general is more stringent, but I can't, that's not today. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, in that case, the Babylonian Talmud is far more lenient. So I, I, um, I do not know how these conversations took place. Um, nothing in the Talmud, not between husbands and wives, and in general, the conversations in the Talmud between rabbis have all been edited in order to um, make the points that the Talmud believes are necessary to make. Okay? I think um, I'm going to go back to anecdote number four, go on to anecdote number four. This is from a different realm of life altogether, Baba Kama, Women in Giving Charity. This is the very last page, 119a, 100, oh, oh my God, I wrote in the Hebrew, I don't know what's on screen, it's 119a, the Hebrew has it at 119b, okay, you got to remove one dot there, I should have done that. This is almost the last page of Tractate Baba Kama. Baba Kama is part of Nizikin, Laws of Damages, and the immediate context is rules of, ra uh, rules of robbery. Uh, Gezo in Hebrew, there's Geneva, which is stealing, and then there's Gezela, which is robbery, and the rules of making restitution. And by the time we get to the end of the tractate, we're talking about borderline cases. And you will see, as I read the text, um, that this, at least my mind, but I believe to your mind as well, is going to be a borderline case. Is this robbery? Is this not robbery? And so on. But one may purchase from women. That's a quote from the Mishnah. And the Sukkot begins with a Tanaitic teaching. Tanaitic teaching simply means it's a teaching from the time of the Mishnah. It's not included in the Mishnah, that early stratum of Talmudic text. But this Tanaitic teaching appears in the uh, Gemara itself. The Gemara itself is a combination of many Tanin of teachings, um, Midrashim, uh, Amoraic teachings, and then anonymous teachings as well. Okay. Well, Klimen Hanashim, Kleitzemer Behuda, so which means that in the province of Judea, that's the middle of the land of Israel, back then, even today, um, you may purchase from women woolen garments, Avaloye Notushmani Muslatot, but not wine, oil, and uh, fine flour. Um, and again, the, I filled it in in the English. Why can't you purchase certain things from women? And you may purchase others because when women are selling you um, woolen garments that they themselves produced, the assumption is that the raw materials that they took, they uh, had their husband's consent to use those raw materials. But if you're buying from women in Judea where wine is one of the standard products, oil and fine flour, she may be selling off her husband's you know, storehouse, uh, stuff from his granary without his permission. And if you're buying it from her without his permission, you are robbing him. And that's what this is about. Abba Sholomer, Mocheret Isha, I happen to like this a lot, but Arba Abba Chamisha Dinar, Kedera Sot Kipala Rosha. So Abba Shaul says, a woman may sell whatever products she is selling for, um, you know, lower, lower amounts, four or five dinar. Dinar is like a dollar. So yeah, she can go ahead and it's called cottage industry, meaning she's selling it from her own house. She's producing, she's knitting, she's cutting, she's sewing, whatever it is, 
that's okay as long as it's small scale, because the implication is if it's large scale that she is producing and selling, she's robbing her husband, taking his um, products without his permission. And then it says, Kabe Lasot Kipala Rosha, four or five dinar is pin money in the sense that she can use it to purchase material to make a kippa for her head. And the reason I like this, I think is obvious, women were the first people in Jewish history to wear a kippa on their heads. Now today, when we wear men who wear kippa, women who wear kippa on their heads are doing it for religious reasons. You see a person with a kippa, right away you say, ah, oh, that's a Jew and that's an observant Jew. But back then, a hat's where um, a kippah is a skull cap. And what you did, if, in my mother's day, I still remember going with my mother to a millinery shop. You first began with a skull cap, something that hugged the head, and then you put a flower and a feather and a net and whatnot, and that's how you built your hat. So they're being um, generous to women and saying, go ahead, you want to earn a little spending money for yourself. I'm not going to give you our ba'ava chamisha dinar. You're going to have to earn it on your own. You want a new hat? Go right ahead. You can work and earn, you know, produce and sell and make your own hat. Okay, but that's not the subject of our sugya. Charity collectors may accept a small donation from a woman, but not a large donation. I'm going to skip the rest of the mission of this, of this time and the teaching because I don't want to run out of time. So that's the important thing for us to understand right now. If a charity collector comes to town and he runs, a par he or she, but it's going to be a he back then, if he runs a parlor meeting, and generally speaking in a sex segregated society, which chances are um, our societies, with our rabbis in the Talmud back then were mainly sex segregated, if he's going to run a parlor meeting, it could very well be that it's a bunch of women that he's going to pitch his charity to, all right? And now we go right into the anecdote, which begins uh, Ravina. Ravina Ikla Lebe Machoza. Ravina is a late Babylonian rabbi, meaning uh, sixth generation, actually seventh generation I have written here. Ikla, he visited, he dropped in on a town called Machoza or Be Machoza. That's another way of saying like New York City. Okay, it's like the city part of it. He drops in on Machoza. Machoza, in uh, Talmudic terms, is actually one of the large metropolitan centers of Jews. You should just know that at the outset. And again, these anecdotes um, are parsimonious in language. And what you have to fill in right here is, and he is a charity collector, and he went to the women of Machoza, parlor meeting or not parlor meeting, however it is, however he did it. And Atu Nashe Deve Machoza, came the women of this town, Ramu Kame, they throw at him Kavle Vishire, chains and bracelets. Um, was it, what did I write here? Chains and bracelets, yes, I got that right. Okay, Kevel is a chain and Shir is a bracelet. Kabil Minai, he accepted it, these donations from these women. Now, since you already have learned three anecdotes and this is the fourth, you know that we've got a problem. You anticipate there's a problem here. And the problem, as you know, what is coming up, what did that Tana Itik teaching say? You know, it's a much older generations before Rabina. The Tana Itik teaching was when women give you a donation, a charitable donation, you can only accept it from them if it's small, but not if it's large. Oh, and I think the reason is obvious because if they're giving you $5, it's probably money that they made selling their woolen garments from the door of their home. But if it's, you know, $500, then it could very well be that they went to their husband's stash of cash and took $500 and gave it to you. So you can accept a small donation from a woman, uh, says that time of teaching, but not a large donation. And what does Ravina do? These women come and they throw jewelry at him meaning they are donating their jewelry, not their husbands, okay? Even the husbands gave it to them, but still, they throw their jewelry, and the implication is, is that it's expensive jewelry because, well, we'll see in a moment, Mahoza is, is a little bit like New York City. And now, Kabil Minahu, he accepted from them these large donations. So, Amarle Rabatos Fala Rabina, his young colleague says to him, the Hatanya, didn't we not learn it in Antoninic teaching? 
And then he quotes it. Now, let me just tell you that it is standard in the Talmud for a junior scholar to challenge, criticize, question, interrogate a senior scholar. Should you think this is impertinent? No, it is not impertinent. It is the way that halacha develops. I didn't know this for a long time. I thought if you look at these questions, it could be senior asking junior, junior asking senior. I did a study recently of the term ATV, means he challenged him with a ton of text. And it's invariably a junior scholar listening to what a senior scholar just taught and saying to himself, wait a second, that senior scholar is saying something different from what I learned you know, yesterday or last month or from a different rabbi. And then you challenge him. And then what does a senior scholar do? He defends, defends whatever it is he said. And in this case, he's gonna defend whatever it is that he did. So we have Ravina accepting from women expensive jewelry against the, Tanid, the ruling of the Tanedic teaching. We have Rabbi Tosfa challenging his senior colleague saying, how could you do such a thing? And now the last line, Amarle, Hane Livne Machoza Dabar Moat Nenu. And Ravina says to um, uh, Rabbi Tosfa, for the people of Machoza, or for the women of Machoza, these are small donations. Now, this is great. I think any charity collector would have said the same, meaning I went, I pitched, I was effective, they gave it to me, and now you're telling me I have to give it back? No, I took it to JTS. It's going to JTS. Uh, all right. And how does he defend his accepting large donations? He's saying, okay, I'm going to use a Manhattan analogy now. These women who gave me the jewelry, they're women from the Upper East Side. Not that I mean to offend anybody. For them, giving me jewelry that they gave me, that is a small donation relative to their uh, net worth. Okay. Whereas if I took that kind of jewelry, call it $1,000, from a woman on the Lower East Side, not to offend anybody on the Lower East Side, which of course has changed, but the old Lower East Side, that would be wrong of me. Because on the Lower East Side, if a woman gives a large donation, she's taking it from her husband without his consent. So he defended himself, which means, and I, again, I looked this up in the Shulchan Aruch, he has reinterpreted the Tarnanic teaching. The Tarnanic teaching is basically saying, in absolute numbers, small, okay, because women don't have lots of money at their disposal, because um, what a woman acquires uh, belongs to her husband, but she can earn a little money doing this, doing that. She wants to give it away to you, fine. You cannot accept a large donation from her. And this rabbi goes ahead and accepts it and justifies it, okay? So that, um, I see we have around 11 minutes. So all I wanna say at the very end is that three out of these four anecdotes have tweaks or modifications, adjustments of Jewish law um, in the direction of leniency. The story about the hulling the grain, a rabbi attempted and failed to introduce astringency. And what did we, so, so the general principle is that the anecdotes are included in the Talmud at the end of the sugya with no following commentary to tell you that the earlier halacha, which was stated at the outset, has now been adjusted, tweaked, modified. And that's how the Shulchan Aruch invariably decides Jewish law without acknowledging, as I already mentioned, without acknowledging change. And what have we learned about women? Well, in the first anecdote, we actually saw that women themselves tweaked Jewish law. I wish I could have brought you five of those uh, instances in which women tweak Jewish law. I have around two more, but I didn't want to limit myself to those today. Very few. In other words, if, if I've got 300 anecdotes in my book, maybe, maybe four of them are about women tweaking halacha. But it's there, okay? You saw in that first sugya, and I love it. And I sometimes ask myself, how do they study that first sugya about Nida, um, changing the law in terms of giving her husband his nightcap? How do they study that in an Orthodox yeshiva? I don't know the answer but I doubt very much that they will read that so good the way I read it. And please understand that my reading is the correct reading. That's what's happening. If you come at it with the assumption that you're gonna read into the text, but it's wrong to do this. If you come at it with the assumption that Jewish law doesn't change, then you're gonna say, oh, 
are these women, what did they do? They were just carrying out a rule of Rabbi Nachman. It's a little bit hard to understand how that is carrying out a rule, but that's what people uh, in that world will superimpose onto the text. And what uh, JTS teaching and studying is all about is reading the texts for what the texts are saying, not imposing our preconceived ideas on the text. Okay, and in the second anecdote, we see a woman who is um, questioning her husband or in the uh, pushing, you know, uh, kind of opposing a change in Jewish law, but the man says, we're tweaking this one, we're gonna bake on the holiday and you're gonna clear out that oven so I get good bread. And the third one, we said the astringent tweak fails. And in the fourth one, we saw the women in the fourth anecdote are generous. And that's what I like to, I personally happen to like to see that in the Talmud because there are plenty of other places in the Talmud, not so much halachic texts, but what we call, you know, the agadic texts where women are portrayed. I won't even give you examples because I don't want you to walk away with that, but which are where women are portrayed negatively. And if anybody is gonna bring one of those to my attention, I will throw this text at them and say, look at these women, they're throwing their jewelry um, to a charity collector because um, they were influenced by what he had to say to them. Okay, uh, I hope I have made my two general points, women's lives, tweaking halakha, and now we have around eight minutes for Q&A. Great, thank you. Um, first, uh, many people are asking about the name of your um, of this latest book. <laughs> oh, okay, that's a question. All right, I have tentatively titled it. I don't yet have a publisher, but what I have tried, I've sent it out uh, without yet getting an answer. I'm calling it for now, The Stories They Tell, colon, uh, Halachic Anecdotes in the Babylonian Talmud. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if it gets published and we'll see if the title remains as, as I have submitted it. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, you all buy it because there are many, many more exciting anecdotes in there. Well, I'm also flooded with comments about what an amazing scholar and teacher you are. So I imagine several people will buy the book. Um, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so so a lot of people are, um, we've, you've talked about the self-interest piece, you know, they're, they're, the rabbis are open to these tweaks because it's in their interest. So I, 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 there have been a lot of comments about that. And he, here's, um, here's sort of a harsh articulation of that, that I um, okay. thought you might respond to. So this person writes, seriously, the takeaway is that rabbis, like many men, are willing to break all sorts of rules if it makes their lives better, and especially if they're not personally doing the work. Is that it? That's what that person wrote. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think, okay, there are two parts here. Are rabbis interested in tweaking laws that make their lives better? Sure, but um, I, as a member of the CJLS, I'm also interested in writing a responsa, responsum that ultimately is gonna make our lives better. I mean, that's really what the Halacha project is all about. It's about Judaism and continuity with the past and values and ethics. But at the same time, it is about making our lives better. Okay, to give you a very trivial example, selling chametz. Selling chametz, in a way, doesn't make any sense. We sell it, it stays in our house. The minute the holiday is over, it belongs to us again. It's, it's not real. But why did they institute it? To make our lives better. So as far as that goes, I, I don't have any problem with rabbis uh, exhibiting self-interest in order to make lives better. But um, wait, what was the other part of this? Um, could you just read it, uh, read it to me one more? There was another piece I wanted to respond to. Sure. Um, that rabbis, like many men, are willing to break all sorts of rules if it makes their lives better, and especially if they're not personally doing the work. Oh, yeah, personally doing the work. Um, again, oh, I know what I wanted to say. Uh, today, I um, chose examples, not so much to illustrate uh, rabbi self-interest or even tweaking the law, I, I needed to choose um, examples. This is all about the other treating the other. I need to choose examples about women. So if you look at, if you don't choose your examples in order to talk about women, you will find that rabbis tweak the law to make, oh, uh, I don't remember if I've said it today. I don't think I've said it today. In my 300 or so cases, 
I will say that 275 of them, I'm estimating, are tweaks in the direction of leniency. So I don't, I don't like to use the word break Jewish law. I'm not even sure I like to use the word self-interest. I will simply say that the, the short anecdotes that end a sugya, a unit, that have no commentary following them, which become the last word, which then get enshrined in the codes of Jewish law, for the most part, these are moves in the direction of leniency. Even today, taking large donations, uh, interpreting the word large and small as relative rather than absolute, that's a, a direction, uh, a, a challenge, I think it's called leniency. Uh, raking out the oven, uh, if there's a brick in it, that's a leniency. Um, culling the barley, leaving the women alone. Well, that's not a leniency, that's just leaving them alone. And the nida thing at the very beginning, figuring out how to serve men wine when you're a menstruate and off limits to him sexually speaking, that is, that is also a leniency for, for men. But um, could I give you an example of a leniency introduced for women? Actually, I can right now. Um, mikvah, you're supposed to, uh, a menstruant is expected to immerse in the mikvah at the end of her days of blood flow in the Talmud, then it got expanded beyond that, but I'm just sticking to the Talmud right now. And then it turned out that in Babylonia, for a woman to go at night, you know, the Jewish day ends at sunset. So at the end of the seventh day that night, she's expected to go to the mikvah and then resume relations with her husband. It turned out that if she went at night, there could be a wild animal that could accost her. There could be some kind of lewd man that's going to accost her. It could be too cold at night and she would get sick. And they, uh, I'm going to, I'm gonna to tongue tie in a moment. So they instituted a change that for any one of those reasons which you could give um, to stop women from going at night and telling them to go to the mikvah the next day in the daytime, that became the rule in the Talmud. And I'm, I was about to say that this is for women's benefit. And then you're gonna question me right now and say, no, no, not really. It's for men's benefit because the more you get women to the mikvah, okay, there's a little delay here. You know, she can't go the seventh night, the night after the seventh day, she'll go the next day. Okay, so the men want their women to be available to them. So they sent them to the mikvah. But you know, I, I don't, I think any example that I would give you one way or another, you're gonna tell me it's for the men's benefit. But you know, the men's benefit, the family benefit, benefit for Judaism, it, it all gets rolled into one. Okay. Uh, so these are, these are, cases that that just illustrate halakha as a living system really um, yeah, thank you that's it halakha is a living system that too could be a title of the book so in our remaining two minutes um a number of people a number of people have asked about um you mentioned a few times that you're on the on the committee on jewish oh. law and standards of the conservative movement um and you know maybe you can spend a minute talking about how 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 this learning um informs your work there Oh my God, this learning totally informs my work there because I'm in the process right now. I hope I'm not violating any rules. I've been asked to write about surrogacy and the child of a Jewish law says that the woman who carries the child is the mother of the child. And then you get the strange situation where it can be a genetically Jewish mother and a non-Jewish surrogate mother. And then by halacha, as it stands right now, the non-Jewish surrogate mother is the halachic mother of a genetically Jewish child. So how does my learning inform that? Uh, again, don't tell anybody, although I see there are a lot of people on this call. But I, I am highly likely to arrive at the conclusion by analyzing a wide variety of Talmudic sources and by, that's, that's, that's plan B, that's secondary. Primary, I'm going to cite ethical principles from the Talmud to say, you, you know, you could say to me, what's ethical about this? But we have only one minute, so I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to cite um, principles from the Talmud, such as, this is an easy one, Dina de Machuta Dina, the law of the land is the law. It doesn't apply in the Talmud, does not apply in the Talmud to cases of personal status. I am probably going to make the argument that it should apply to this particular case of personal status, because to tell um, a Jewish egg donor, no, a non-Jewish egg donor housed by a Jewish mother, the child is Jewish, even though genetically not Jewish, and then 
a genetically Jewish embryo um, brought to term by a non-Jewish mother, the child is non-Jewish, that, that doesn't make sense. We have what's called in the Talmud, Kal a fourth year of reasoning. You know, if this is true, then certainly that should be true too. So yes, the, the Talmud is there. It's ingrained in my head by now. It's part of me. I have um, by osmosis absorbed the Talmud. And yes, uh, a lot of materials that I have from the Talmud are gonna be brought to bear on that question, but you're not allowed to tell anybody that that's what I'm working on or that that's the conclusion I have more or less decided I'm going to arrive at. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you for sharing this secret with us. Um, and more importantly, thank you so much for sharing your um, your scholarship, your insights, and uh, and also your enthusiasm for <laughs> for delving deeply into Talmud study. It's uh, it's a wonderful session. We really appreciate it. Um, and I want to uh, invite everyone back next week for a completely different session with uh, Professor Ben Summer on how the Bible sees the gods of other nations. And you may be surprised, um, may or may not be surprised to know that the that the Bible um, does not rule out the idea that there are other gods, um, although we're not supposed to worship them. Anyway, it should be a fascinating session. Um, but thank you so much again to Rabbi Dr. Houtman for this wonderful teaching today. Take care, everyone. Shalom, shalom.